Welcome back to Annie Quest. This is my recap for the anime solo leveling. If you enjoy my recaps, please think about subscribing. We see on an island, where a group of hunters face off against several giant monster ants. Their leader gets right up close to one of the ants and says they have to hold them back no matter what, no retreat allowed. But damn, these hunters get overwhelmed real quick. The leader is losing consciousness, and one of the ants is chowing down on his insides. It looks like he's gonna die. But out of nowhere, this dude with crazy strong healing magic saves him just in the nick of time. The leader freaks out because this guy is about to get attacked too. But boom, he gets saved too. And the guy who saved the leader calls on his teammate to finish off the ants. This next guy is a total beast, beating the crap out of those monsters easily. The first group realizes that they were just side characters all along. And these dudes who came to save them are S-rank hunters, the best of the best. They wipe out the red ants easily. But then this even bigger albino ant shows up. The attackers decide to engage the aunt, while they leave the wounded leader to the healer. They go all out, using their teamwork to rip off its face and arms. The super powerful warrior uses one of those ripped off arms to obliterate the giant ant. But hold up, there's no time to celebrate because the albino ant army arrives. It turns out the giant ant was just one of many, but these hunters ain't scared man. The mage guy powers up his lightning, and the brute dude goes into full-on hulk mode, ripping his clothes apart with his massive muscles. You can see their crazy fight from the city, where this other guy named Choi is relieved they made it in time. Choi's got his hands full because the city's got a serious ant problem too, but he handles it like a boss and lights it up with some serious flames, leaving only the colorless ones, and he's got a team of exterminators to help him out. We then learn that over 10 years ago, Portals that could connect to a different dimension suddenly appeared in the world. And guess what? All types of monsters come from the portal. Only folks with special powers, called hunters, can fight them off. The hunters are ranked based on their magical abilities, from S rank being the highest to E rank being the lowest. But here's the kicker, once their powers awaken, they can't get any stronger, no matter how hard they try. Three years have gone by, and that construction site is now a dungeon raid spot. We see this dude grabbing some drink before he heads in, and one of his friends calls out to him. He's surprised to see him there since he heard that Park quit being a hunter. That was true, but then the economy smacked him in the face after his wife got pregnant a second time. So the dude needed to make a ton of cash real quick, and a dungeon raid seemed like the perfect way to do it. We see that our hero has arrived. His name is Jinwoo. He recently joined the group, but they've already nicknamed him the weakest hunter ever. He greets everyone as he walks in. So Park asks why everyone seems to know him, thinking maybe he's some super strong hunter, but it's the complete opposite. Jinwoo is known as the weakest hunter ever. He managed to get himself injured and ended up in the hospital in an E-rank dungeon. They might as well create a new rank just for him, like an F rank, because he's that weak. But here's the thing, his reputation as the weakest works in his favor. If they call him in for a dungeon raid, it means it's probably gonna be a piece of cake. Jinwoo heard every word they said about him, but he couldn't deny it, because it was true. He's just that damn weak. This woman named Juhi calls him out, and it turns out Jinwoo knows her from a previous mission they did together. But forget the greetings, she's more concerned about his latest injuries, and asks him what the hell happened this time. They sit down, and Jinwoo explains the embarrassing fact that he got injured in the lowest ranking dungeon. And get this, the team didn't even have a healer with them, because they didn't think any hunter would be dumb enough to injure themselves there. But they didn't take into account Jinwoo Dumbass' existence. Juhi gets pissed on his behalf, but Jinwoo already knows it ain't their fault. It's his damn fault for being so weak in the first place. It's time to enter the dungeon, and they're all about to head in. So this dude named Song Chiel suggests he be the party leader for this expedition. No one objects, so he leads the way. And before Jinwoo goes in, he gets a friendly reminder to stick close to the group, so he doesn't get hurt again. Jinwoo's only weapon is a crappy little knife with barely any magic power because that's all he can afford with his measly earnings. But he swears he'll give it his all anyway. In another place, there's this president of the Hunters Association named Juhi. He just finished a meeting with the government. They warned him about something called Dungeon Break that they needed to avoid. However, these same people demanded that they get the goods obtained from the dungeon. The members of the association make their living by selling the stuff they find in the dungeon, so Juhi doesn't have a problem with that request. The crystals they get from defeating magical creatures are called magic gems, and they sell them for money. Now let's go back to Jinwoo. Somehow, he managed to get his hands on a magic gem. Of course, he's thrilled about finally getting one, but he quickly has to defend himself against a goblin. When Jinwoo attacks the goblin, Jinwoo's blade shatters to pieces. The goblin stabs our hero, 
and instead of fighting back, Jinwoo just stands there screaming. Luckily, the big guy from earlier rushes past the useless girl and saves Jinwoo. While she heals him, Jinwoo can only watch as the rest of the team does all the work. We then find out that magic gems obtained from high-ranking magical creatures can be used to make more powerful weapons to defeat even stronger creatures. Mana crystals from the dungeon can also be used as weapons, but they're not nearly as effective as the magic gems. The government wants to use these items as a new kind of energy source. It's safer, more efficient, and causes less pollution compared to other types of power. It's like the perfect green energy, and the government is desperately researching how to generate electricity from these gems and crystals. Since these items can only come from the dungeon, hunters become incredibly valuable. Meanwhile, back in the dungeon, the team celebrates their victory after defeating the dungeon boss. Jinwoo must be the weakest person ever because he took a beating and Jinwoo is still healing him. She wonders why he even became a hunter if he's always getting injured, and thinks he's gonna meet his end one day. Jinwoo apologizes, but his words don't mean much, and she's just worried about him. Everyone gets their share of the spoils from the battle, but there weren't many mana crystals, so they won't make much money. Jinwoo starts to doubt himself and feels disappointed to have only gotten a measly e rank gem. He starts questioning if it's even worth risking his life for. One guy on the team calls everyone's attention to a huge hole and they all gather around to figure out what the heck it is. Looks like a cave, but they're in a dungeon, so it's more likely to be a double dungeon. It's rare, but they've heard of it before, and their suspicion is confirmed, because they've already taken down the dungeon boss, yet the place hasn't started closing like a regular dungeon would. It seems like there's more loot to be grabbed deeper inside. Now Song Chiel tries to be the voice of reason and suggests that they follow the normal protocol by informing the association about the double dungeon and following their instructions. But the team ain't down with that idea, because it means giving up all the untapped loot that's probably waiting for them down there. Then this guy Park says, it's just an F-rank dungeon, and then he brings up his wife and kid, talking about how he needs to make more money to support them. Song Chiel gets the point they're trying to make, but he wants to hear everyone's opinions before making a decision. Each team member chimes in with a mix of approval for venturing deeper and the realization that this is a clear death trap. In reality, six voices are answering to go to the cave, while six voices want to turn back. That means someone needs to break that tie, and the only one left who hasn't voted is Jinwoo. The decision is left up to him, and he knows damn well that a D-ranked dungeon is insanely dangerous for him. But with his father missing, he's the only one in his family who can earn any money. He's already burdened with a ton of financial responsibilities. His mom's in the hospital, and his sister needs to go to college, so he can't stay broke forever. So he decides to go into the dungeon. Elsewhere, in the lab, where people are getting tested for their magical powers. In the waiting room, the others are ready to recruit any promising new hunters. This ranked hunter Choi has told his people that regardless of age or gender, they're getting recruited. Meanwhile, some thieves snatch a purse and get ready to run over a girl who's in their way. This girl fearlessly snatches the purse back from those guys without even blinking. It's like it's just a regular day for her. This girl is Cha Hee, the famous S-rank hunter. She's a celebrity, but she can't handle all the attention. Her fans go crazy over her, and she makes a super dramatic exit. Back in the dungeon, the party has been walking for 40 minutes now, and they haven't found anything valuable yet. And the portal to a dungeon closes after an hour so they only have another 20 minutes before they're out of time completely. Jin Wu says sorry to Juhi for making her come along, because of his vote, but she's more pissed about how he doesn't worry more about his own life. If he had been stabbed just a bit higher, he'd be dead. And on top of that, she had a hard time healing his hands and feet. She keeps scolding him, and he realizes that it's only because of the B-rank healer that he can survive. Jinwoo feels sorry, so she suggests that buying her a meal would be a good apology. Our boy is taken aback by her forwardness, but before they can continue their discussion, the team discovers the boss's room. It's unusual to find such massive doors, so something feels off. Kim refuses to leave empty-handed and is determined to enter, with the others joining him. Meanwhile, in the city, a group of hunters are going through an orientation where they watch a video of Gunhee. He explains that the dungeon portal has been around for over 10 years, and there are still many mysteries within. Being a hunter is dangerous, even for the most experienced ones, so they must always be cautious during a raid mission. They can't afford to be arrogant, and the main key to survival is extreme caution. However, this group in the dungeon seems to have completely forgotten those words and is entering a mysterious, dangerous, and unexplored room. These guys act very naturally, as if they're on some amusement park ride, as they've never seen a dungeon like this before. 
The statues look ancient and at least a hundred years old. Jin Wu is fixated on the biggest one, and Ju He starts feeling uneasy due to the eerie silence. Everyone wonders where the boss is, and Song Chiel stares at something that looks like a magic circle on the floor. His attention is drawn to a tablet with ancient writings, containing commandments about worshipping some god. But Song is more concerned about something else. Ju He is certain she saw the giant statue's eyes move as if it was looking right at them. Jin Wu thinks she's just losing her mind, but everyone is shocked when the door suddenly slams shut. One dude on the team, who didn't even want to come in the first place, realizes something's off and tries to bail. But out of nowhere, one of the statues slices off half his body in an instant. Everyone loses their minds, because not only did someone just die, they got taken out so damn fast that nobody stands a chance against that power. Our boy turns his gaze back to the main statue, hoping that it doesn't move as well, but to his horror, it looks back at him. We take a peek into Jin Wu's past, the dude's been through some serious life or death situations. In his first mission, he got separated from his crew and attacked. Another time, he damn near starved to death while trapped in a maze. He's even been injured by some weak magic beast and ended up in the hospital for weeks. Even the lowest ranked crappiest dungeons pose a real threat to this guy. Most hunters collect gems and sell them to buy better weapons, which they use to take down tougher beasts and earn bigger rewards. But not Jin Wu. He's stuck with a cheap little knife, and if that thing ever breaks during a fight, he's left fighting barehanded. His clothes are all raggedy with holes in them. He constantly gets mocked by others. He is stuck in this dangerous job that barely pays the bills. His only way to survive is by finding clever tricks and studying every little detail around him. Fast forward to the present, Jin Wu senses the danger oozing out of the giant statue, but he can't warn the others in time. That giant shoots out a massive beam from its eyes, causing chaos and destruction. The team is freaked out, unable to wrap their heads around what's going on. Ju He's trembling in fear and his buddy Jin Wu is wondering how the hell things ended up like this. They're trapped with no way out, and even if Jin Wu gets lucky this time, he knows deep down he's gonna end up dead sooner or later. But our boy wished to catch the One Piece episode before he died. Song Chiel tells everyone to stay put because the statue will strike again if they move. Jin Wu is too terrified to move, and Song thanks Jin Wu for his earlier warning, when he shouts for everyone to get down because he saved them all. Song is a seriously tough dude, and Jin Wu is shocked to see that he's missing an arm. Jin Wu needs to stop the bleeding for him because Ju He is freaking out and can't handle the pressure. She's a B-rank healer, but her fearfulness limits her to easy raids only. Song has been on plenty of B-rank raids himself, so he can tell that this statue is in a rank, or maybe even an S-rank. The tablet had some stuff written about praising God or facing consequences, so Jin Wu figures that this statue must be the God it was talking about. We then find out that 10 years ago, these gates started appearing all over the place and brought about all sorts of supernatural stuff. One result of this is people awakening special powers called hunters. Their job is to take down monsters in the dungeons, and once a hunter's power awakens, it stays the same. At school, Jin Wu's sister tells some girl about how her brother always ends up getting hurt. This girl can't believe that Jin Wu is a hunter and says she'd be a better hunter than him. Back in the dungeon, Song wants to come up with a plan to escape, but this one man gets impatient. He just signed up with some famous guild and doesn't want to die now. This guy is confident that his insane speed will get him out of there. He does have some crazy speed as he takes off running, but the statue disintegrates him, leaving only his fast feet behind. That makes it clear that this statue could wipe them all out in a heartbeat if it wanted to, and it could do it easily. So, why doesn't it? Jin Wu realizes it must have something to do with the first command, which is to worship God. Jin Wu gets up, having come up with an idea, and gets a determined look on his face. Song is worried, but amazed to see that Jin Wu hasn't given up on surviving this mess, judging by the fire in his eyes. Jin Wu locks eyes with the statue and manages to prevent it from attacking at the very last moment. Our boy figures something out and tells everyone to bow down. Jin Wu thinks that if they show some respect to God by keeping their heads low, these freaky statues won't attack. Now everyone else is too damn clueless to come up with a better plan, so they all start bowing down to the statue, scared as hell hoping this will save their sorry asses. But things get terrifying when the statue makes a terrifying face, moving mutton chop despite all the advice, and gets all pumped up because the statue ain't attacking anymore. And guess what? Everyone follows his dumb lead. But our boy he say, there's more to this crap. Right then, the statue makes a crazy move, and stands the hell up. Now the supposed leader turns to Jin Wu, hoping he's got a plan. 
But damn, our boy doesn't. But for the fact that they can't break the commandments set by the tablet. The second commandment says they gotta praise God. So this brave dude with long hair steps up and starts praying to the damn thing. Everyone thinks it's working as the monster slows down. But Jinwoo knows better and reveals that the dude's words don't apply to this god. But boom, the statue stomps the poor guy and everyone loses their minds. It's straight up chaos. Some random girl gets crushed and everyone decides it's best to scatter. Park's thinking about his family and how he can't leave them fatherless, but he makes the wrong move and gets sliced up by another statue. Meanwhile, Jinwoo's hauling ass with Juhi, racking his brain for a way to praise this messed up god. I mean this monster's practically the devil, so how the hell do you come up with something to praise about it? But our hero knows he can't just ditch Juhi because everyone around them is dropping like flies. Jinwoo's freaking out, searching for any damn clue. He's checking out everything these statues are holding. Then he gets an idea and tells everyone to head to the statues that are holding instruments. So everyone follows his lead, and it becomes clear that these statues don't attack. Instead, they start playing their damn instruments. But when our boy gets to his statue, it's not playing any music, so he figures it doesn't work with two people. Jinwoo leaves Juhi behind, and that statue starts playing its tune. He hauls ass to find his statue, but damn, he nearly gets crushed. And then someone screams because Jinwoo's landed his sorry ass in front of the wrong goddamn statue. It slams its shield right on top of him, and Juhi goes nuts, screaming for Jinwoo. Our boy is still kicking, but he's in really bad shape, determined as hell not to give up. But damn, that giant's ready to finish him off for good. Jinwoo ain't ready to bite the dust, though even as that massive mofo stomps its foot down our boy. But guess what? Just in the nick of time, a statue starts singing. And we see Jinwoo made it to that statue just in the nick of time. He finally gets what it means to praise God, and the giant statue takes a chill pill and sits its ass down. Jinwoo tells Juhi he's fine, but she's shocked to see his foot ripped off. He tries to assure her he'll be alright, but she ain't having it. She's dead set on healing him, but her own body starts giving up on her. Everybody's in shock seeing how that goddamn raid went straight to hell. Some dude even tells Song that losing his arm was karma for leading them down this messed up path, as their leader. Others think that's a bit too harsh, but Song takes full responsibility. But Jinwoo's way smarter than all these fools, because he knows there's no time for fighting because there's still one commandment left. Right then and there, the giant raises an altar smack in the middle of the room. Jinwoo knows them well from the legends, where they're used for offering treasure and sacrifices to the gods. The third commandment was all about proving your faith in God. Kim figures the sacrifice gotta be someone's life, and he couldn't think of a better candidate than their leader. They've all seen their teammates die, and Song's the one to blame. So Song steps up to that altar, but Jinwoo points out it ain't all his fault, since they all voted to come down there. Then fire pops up as Song approaches the altar, and he asks Jinwoo if there's something else he gotta do. Our boy being the smartest, and bravest of them all, asks the others to help him get to the altar so he can check it out. Jinwoo ain't thinking nothing bad's gonna happen to them, so they get him there, and what do they find? And they find that more flames appear. Song keeps pressing Jinwoo for answers, but he ain't come up with any yet. Song explains the gate's been open for a whole damn week, so the statues are about to start moving again before anyone comes to rescue them. Jinwoo remembers how it takes a full seven days for a gate to open wide open, and that's called the dungeon break. When that happens, their beasts can cross over to our side. The main goal of these raids is to defeat the dungeon boss and shut the gate down before that time's up. So if they can't beat this boss right now, that damn giant's gonna come barging into our world, and that shit's straight up terrifying. Back in their world, Jinna goes to see Jinwoo's mom, and they start chatting. But damn, their mom is in really bad shape. In the dungeon, Jinwoo tells the scaredy cats of the group to come over to the altar. He predicts that they need a flame for each person. Once they do it, more flames pop up, and the damn door opens wide. They're all freaking out, thinking it might be a trap. And to their surprise, the other statues start moving towards them. Everyone is panicking, but Jinwoo keeps his cool and starts analyzing the situation. This freaking genius is something else. He tells everyone to keep their eyes on the statues because they won't move if we're watching them. Everyone follows his orders, and shockingly it works. Everyone's doing their best to keep their eyes on those terrifying statues, but then this one chick gives in to fear, and tries to haul ass toward the door. As soon as she crosses the circle, her flame goes out, but she manages to make it out the damn door. Song Chiel can't figure out what the hell is happening. The door closed a bit, but the girl made it out alright. 
he thought we were supposed to stay in the circle, so naturally, he turned to Jinwoo for answers. Jinwoo's just as confused, but he starts analyzing everything again. Those blue flames have been burning out over time. One of the fire ones went out when that girl escaped. The first order was to revere, the second was to praise, and the third was to prove our faith. Jinwoo is damn sure that the door must be a trap. This situation is dangerous as hell, and it's messing with our heads, giving us false hope. It makes him wonder if this is some test of our faith in this god. Jinwoo gets thrown to the ground, as the next dumbass decides to make a run for it, and the same shit happens. His flame goes out, the door closes a bit more, and he seems to escape. Kim starts thinking about leaving too, but Jinwoo warns everyone not to move. If anyone else leaves, we won't have enough eyes on the statues to keep them from moving. He reminds everyone that as long as we keep our eyes on those statues and stay put, we'll be safe. Jinwoo shows off his deduction skills once again, saying that the blue flames are like a damn timer, and when they're all gone, we can leave. Kim points out that there's also a chance we'll get trapped when the timer runs out. He admits he didn't expect Jinwoo, the weakest member, to achieve this amount of success. They're only alive thanks to him. But Kim's got a family waiting for him, and he doesn't want to die. He just wants to make it home, and can't risk Jinwoo being wrong. Kim says sorry and bolts out the door. Our boy won't have enough eyes to keep tabs on all these damn statues. Those statues start moving again. Jinwoo ain't about to bite the dust here though. Things are worse than ever, but he reminds himself that he's pulled through tough situations before. But damn, things are worse than ever now. But Song Chiel shockingly tells Jinwoo and Juhi to leave. He predicts that as long as one person stays by the altar, the door will stay open. And since Jinwoo and Juhi have some long lives ahead of them, he insists they should be the ones to make a run for it. Song Chiel wants Juhi to look after Jinwoo, but the poor girl's legs give. Things couldn't possibly get any worse, and Song realizes that Juhi must have pushed herself too hard to heal Jinwoo. Things have gone to the dogs, so Jinwoo tells everyone to leave him behind. Juhi needs someone to carry her ass out of there, and Song's the only one with two working feet. Juhi thinks she should be the one left behind, but Jinwoo reminds her about that lunch date they had planned. He hands her his gem so she can treat herself to a meal, and promises to get the change when they all make it out of this dungeon. Juhi won't ditch him, but Song apologizes and knocks her out. They're running out of time. He apologizes to Jinwoo too, and bolts with Juhi to safety. Our boy can at least find comfort in knowing he's the only one who's gotta bite it, and his only regret is not having a better damn life insurance policy. Our hero grabs hold of a sword, dead set on taking one of these statues down with him. He tells them to bring it on. Those statues go full savage mode, ripping into him as he fights tooth and nail to stay alive. Jinwoo thinks about how he has always been the weakest. He's constantly getting mocked for it, but he's always given it his all. These damn statues ain't letting up, they chop off his arm, and Jinwoo screams in pure agony. He's angry because it doesn't have to end this way after he poured his heart and soul into trying to become stronger. But these statues keep inflicting more pain, and thrash him about further. But despite all the setbacks, he can't help but think about how he gave everything he had to make it this far. He's a fighter, even with just a sliver of life left in him. He's got this burning desire to let out a scream of pure anger, but he can't even do that as he is stabbed through the chest. Jinwoo's on the brink of death, but you can feel the rage coursing through his veins. He starts reflecting on how the first few people who ran away were just weaklings. They claimed they couldn't handle it anymore, but deep down, they were just selfish. Those fools were only looking out for themselves, and it's always the most selfish jerks who end up benefiting the most. That thought fuels Jinwoo's rage even further. He's got a family too. All he wants is to make it back home alive, just like those lucky ones before him. The pain is unbearable, and he starts wondering if it's a good thing that he's the only one who has to die. In his battered state, Jinwoo's mind starts wandering, and he realizes what a hypocrite he's been. He's struggling to catch his breath, desperately clinging to life. He doesn't want to die, but the final attack comes crashing down on him, and our boy wishes he could have one more shot. And just when it seems like it's all over, the final blue flame goes out, and this mysterious notification pops up out of nowhere. It turns out he's completed some secret quest called Courage of the Weak. It's offering him the opportunity to become a player. The catch is if he doesn't accept, the player's heart will stop in a fraction of a second, so no choice, and he hits that yes damn button. Right at that moment, Jinwoo wakes up in the damn hospital, and he's straight up shocked to find out that he's still got his damn arm. He remembers getting dismembered and all, but here he is, with his leg intact too. No sign of getting stabbed in the chest either, so he starts thinking, was that all just a crazy dream? 
And just when he's pondering this, some dude named Wu rolls up and introduces himself as the manager of the Hunter Association surveillance team. And that purple-haired dude, yeah, his name's Kang, but they ain't saying why they are there. They do reveal that Jin Wu was unconscious for three straight days. And get this, Juhi and Song ain't dead either. Song lost his arm though, so he might have to peace out as a hunter. Juhi's all sorts of messed up mentally, so she's getting psychiatric care. But it doesn't look too good bro, so she's probably not gonna continue as a hunter. Only six peeps made it out alive from that crazy double dungeon they stumbled upon. Being a hunter is always a risky business, but what went down that day was a real tragedy. And here's the real mind boggler, when another guild showed up later after being alerted by the survivors, and they found just Jinwoo. No signs of the temple or their statues. The survivors all told the same wild ass story, which is hella hard to believe. Everyone's stories match up perfectly, so nobody's suspecting them, it's a crazy situation. And now, Wu's got this theory, he looks at Jinwoo, and asks if he has a second awakening. Wu explains that a hunter's power is determined when they awaken it, and it doesn't change after that. But on some crazy rare occasions, a hunter can go through a second awakening. This mind-blowing event can push them past their previous limits, even to the ORS rank. Jin Wu gets all pumped up, thinking about this, and Wu brings out this meter thing to test Jin Wu's power. Wu figures that if they really went up against an instant-level magic beast as the survivors said, a low-level hunter wouldn't stand a chance. And since there ain't a single monster trace left behind, the most likely explanation is Jin Wu's second awakening. Jin Wu's hyped as hell to hear the results of his mana test. But damn, the results ain't looking good. Wu admits they messed up, and they leave. Turns out Jin Wu only scores a lousy 10 on the test. Even E rankers usually get at least 70. A score of 10 puts Jin Wu in civilian territory. And to top it off, the dungeon just vanished, so they can't even investigate how Jin Wu pulled off survival. Jin Wu's bummed out by the whole damn thing, but he can't help but wonder why those guys didn't ask about the freaking thing floating in the air. He's freaking out, wondering if he's the only one who can see this, and then he realizes it's like a touch screen or something. Jin Wu remembers getting a message about becoming a player, but his sister interrupts his thoughts. She's all worried about him, so he apologizes and asks if she can see the panel. She can't see it, so he asks if she knows how opening messages in games usually work. Jinna thinks he's gone nuts, but our boy reminds her she used to be a gamer. She gives him the obvious answer, saying he just needs to check his inbox. Right then, a notification pops up saying Jin Wu has a daily quest, which is all about strength training. After Jinna leaves, our hero opens up a ton of these panels. They explain that the system is there to help the player get better, and if he doesn't follow it, there's gonna be consequences. They've also sent him some rewards, but Jin Wu has no clue what any of it means. Jin Wu accepts his daily quest, which sets out a bunch of goals like push-ups, sit-ups, squats, and running. But if he fails to complete the quest, he's gonna get penalized. Jin Wu starts wondering if this whole thing's a joke since he's stuck in the hospital and ain't got no energy for any of that crap. Outside, Wu tells the chairman that Jin Wu didn't have a second awakening. The whole incident's still a mystery, so they gonna mark it as a special case and look into it more. Meanwhile, Mr. Choi tells Cha He that she gonna be part of a B-rank raid as an instructor. This raid's gonna test and train the recruits, and he can't think of a better instructor than her. Cha He doubts her teaching skills, but Mr. Choi tells her to just fight like she always does, and everyone gonna learn from watching her. He goes on to explain that the Hunter Guild is one of the top 5 guilds in the country, but they ain't nothing special on the international stage. Hunters can't level up on their own, but they can improve their collective combat skills. Somewhere else, another gate opens up, and the observers are all like, damn, when are the Hunters gonna show up? At the freaking hospital, Jin Wu falls asleep as the clock reaches midnight. Then a damn notification pops up, saying he didn't finish his quest, and suddenly the ground starts shaking like crazy. Jin Wu is frigging terrified when he finds himself in the middle of a damn desert, and to make things worse, there's this giant creepy caterpillar monster right in front of him. But suddenly another notification pops up, saying he's got a penalty quest, and he's gotta survive for four freaking hours. Back at the hospital, the nurses are all like, where the hell is Jin Wu? Because he's nowhere to be found. Little do they know our hero is stuck in some other dimension, running for his damn life. The giant caterpillar thing is closing in on him, and he's like, oh shit, because there's more than one of them. And if that ain't bad enough, Jin Wu still has two hours to get his ass back to the hospital. The nurses keep searching for him, they are all worried. Meanwhile, poor Jin Wu is running his ass off, knowing he's running out of time. The caterpillars are getting closer and closer, but just as the clock hits the deadline, Jin Wu finds himself back at the hospital. 
The notification confirms that he completed the penalty quest, but Jinwoo is so drained that he ends up puking and passing out. He gets another reward, but he's out cold and has no idea. Later on, Jinwoo tells his sister that he's healing up nicely and might be able to go home soon. So he gets dressed in his fancy tracksuit and heads outside. Over in another place, Juhi gets a request to join a raid, because some D-rank gate has shown up. The other guilds are busy, and Juhi can't bring herself to agree to go. On the other hand, Juhi gets some good news that Jinwoo has woken up from his coma. Juhi is all nervous and shit as she goes to visit him, but the nurses are like, he's running again, just like every day since he woke up. Outside, Jinwoo is thinking about how it's been four days since he woke up, and he's learned a few things. First off, those pop-up windows he's been seeing are for real, not some crazy hallucinations. And when he completes his daily quest, he gets three types of rewards. One is full recovery, which he uses now to shake off all that exhaustion from running. Then there are ability points, which he can use to boost his skills. Currently, our boy can totally feel the difference. He's got some serious power now. So this dude Jinwoo, he's got mad skills with inventory screens. Jinwoo takes a moment to think about how dang strange his life has just become and points out how it's like a freaking video game. But while he was messing with his screens, everyone around was just gawking at him. Anyway, this dude completes his daily quest and gets a random loot box as a reward. And guess what? Today's loot is a mysterious key. Usually, he just gets useless junk like pens and bandages, so this key is a total surprise. Then he gets a notification saying the key is for teleporting to some instant dungeon, with a location and all. Now Jinwoo doesn't know what the heck an instance dungeon is, but based on everything that's been going down, he figures it's some kind of event to help him get stronger. In this world, these things called gates open up all the time, and they even get a news report to keep track of them. Jinwoo goes to see his mom and remembers when he found her passed out. Turns out she's got this messed up sleep disease called Final Rest, and it showed up when the gates appeared. Some people say it's because of the constant exposure to mana. Modern medicine can't do much except keep them on life support. Jinwoo busted his ass to make enough money to become a hunter so he could pay for his mom's treatment. He told Jinna that he'd soon be able to afford their mom's treatment, but she was scared shitless about how dangerous being a hunter is. Jinwoo tries to reassure her that things will be okay from now on and tells her to trust him. But damn, it's clear that he's useless in a fight, and he ain't getting nothing from the rewards because of it. But things are different now, Jinwoo's putting in work to train his body, pumping all his ability points into strength. He even shows off an apple that he's crushing to show his progress. This dude's dead set on getting stronger and ain't taking no shit. So he heads to the location from the key notification, fully prepared for whatever's coming. And if shit gets too real like it did in that raid, he'll just haul ass and run away. When Jinwoo pulls out his key, bam, a freaking keyhole appears out of nowhere. Jinwoo uses the key to unlock it, and boom, old mysterious gate shows up. So he walks through it, and guess what? A notification pops up saying he's in an instance dungeon. The exit's sealed off, but regular folks don't even notice it. Turns out this place is like a whole other dimension, and these instance dungeons ain't like your regular dungeons. He thinks it's kinda like a red gate, but he ain't got much info on those since he's never been in one. Jinwoo realizes he can't just run like he planned, and then another notification pops up. It says the only way out of this joint is by beating the boss or using a teleportation stone. Jinwoo's couldn't even take down an E-rank beast before, and now I gotta clear a whole instance dungeon all by myself. He wonders if he's really up for it, but he figures he ain't got no choice. So he starts making his way through. But damn, Jinwoo's confidence starts to fade real quickly. And it ain't without reason, because a bunch of goblins show up right in front of him. Jinwoo gets a flashback of when he got stabbed, and these goblins come at him. These little suckers are relentless, they're swinging and charging like crazy, but Jinwoo's doing a good job dodging and blocking them. But damn, he gets overwhelmed eventually. But you know what? Jinwoo gets pissed off and straight up stabs one of those goblins. He's feeling more confident after that, so he takes out the other two like it's nothing. Jinwoo can tell he's getting stronger, but out of nowhere, this beast shows up. It shatters his freaking dagger like it's made of glass. Jinwoo can sense this monster is way stronger than the goblins. As this creature stares him down, his legs freeze up. He's thinking, what the hell, am I scared? Because he didn't think he was traumatized from the raid. But his legs keep trembling, and this monster starts its attack. Jinwoo barely dodges it, but it manages to scratch him. He ain't got no healer with him, so if he gets injured again, game over for him. This monster lets out a howl and charges straight at Jinwoo. Jinwoo is dodging like a ninja, he can't believe how damn light he feels. The monster tries to come at him again, 
but Jinwoo ain't taking that crap no more. He's done being a pushover and decides to throw a powerful punch. Damn, he can't believe how much stronger he feels after beefing up his strength. Sure the monsters still got the upper hand, but Jinwoo ain't giving up without a fight for his damn life. His attacks ain't doing much though, so he's gotta focus on evading the monster's strikes. Now Jinwoo's at a loss for what to do next. He realizes he can't handle this alone, so he bolts because he ain't got no party or healer. All he's got in his bag is water and food, and he wishes he had a weapon with some magical mojo. But then, Jin Wu gets a freaking brilliant idea. He checks his inventory and pulls out a sword at the freaking last moment. And boom, he slices that monster in half with a sword. Jin Wu has no freaking clue how the sword ended up in there, but he remembers Kim saying he dropped 3 million on it. That's a weapon Jin Wu could never afford. But who the hell cares? It's an emergency, so he decides to make the most out of it. The pain from the fight is starting to fade, but then two more of these damn monsters show up. Jinwoo ain't scared anymore though because he got his weapon. But damn, the sword gets stuck. He's panicking, desperately trying to yank it out while the monsters close in. Just in the nick of time, he manages to free it. Jinwoo kicks one of the wolves away, but damn, the other one's got some steel fangs. He kicks that sucker and tells it to find something else to chew on because he just got his sword. He takes down that monster, and now there's only one left. But Jinwoo's like, these things ain't nothing compared to the giant statue. Now all Jinwoo's gotta do is act tough, and the remaining wolf runs off like a scaredy cat. When he finally gets a break, Jinwoo realizes he's reached level 2, something that never happened with his daily quests. He figures it's because this was real combat, and he realizes all his stats go up by 1 when he levels up. So he gets 5 points from real combat, while daily quests only give him 3. Fighting is more efficient, no doubt about it. He ain't sure exactly how much one point makes a difference yet, but Jinwoo's certain that strength is the most important stat of them all. He's got it at 32 now, and he feels like he's walking on air. He thinks the higher his base abilities grow, the more points he'll gain. Our boy is more fired up than ever now that he's found a way to get stronger. So he goes to check the beast for essence stones, but damn, he gets items instead. Like in games, Jinwoo figures this dungeon, and the magic beasts inside are different from the ones in gates. And guess what? He's shocked to find out his system has a freaking shop, but his level is too low to buy anything. At least he can sell stuff though. The dude manages to get 20 gold from a tooth. Jin Wu ain't sure how much that's worth, but he remembers he's in an e rank dungeon, so it probably ain't much. Now Jin Wu's thinking about what he's gotta do next. He can't bounce until he beats the boss, and he ain't got a clue where to find a teleportation stone. To make things worse, if he stays too long, he'll run out of food. He knows damn well he can't take down a boss right now, even if it's just e rank so he's wondering if he should level up first. Right then, Jinwoo's mind gets blown when a whole pack of wolves shows up. Jinwoo tells himself not to be scared because he already knows what dying feels like. This time, he charges straight at them wolves and starts slicing them up like a meat. Jinwoo promises he ain't going down easy, but he knows them wolves ain't gonna give up either. This dude's getting a little crazy because he wants the fight to last and be intense. He just wants to get stronger, so he's gonna follow all them ridiculous rules from the system. Jinwoo chops through all the monsters and notifications pop up everywhere like crazy. When he's done, he gets a final notification saying he's now the wolf assassin. Outside, some folks walk by a portal, and they wish the damn city would do something about it already. Inside the dungeon, Jinwoo's dead tired, and he realizes his sword's about to give out. Just then, he gets a notification explaining the perks of being a wolf assassin. Jinwoo gets a 40% boost to all his abilities when fighting animal-type monsters. And guess what? When he checks his inventory, he finds a whole bunch of fangs and a cloak. But here's the real kicker. He also finds a teleportation stone. Jinwoo thinks about using it to bail, but he hesitates because he might never get this easy of a chance to get stronger again. He's got no clue what's gonna happen to this dungeon when he leaves, it might just vanish into thin air. It could be like some limited time event in a game and vanishing without a trace. Faced with this tough decision, Jinwoo decides to keep moving forward. Meanwhile, Juhi gets a call from the Hunter Association saying there's been a dungeon break at a gate nearby. They're running low on healers so they need her help. 
Juhi feels guilty because she turned them down before, but now she's like, damn, Jinwoo worked his ass off, I gotta step up. While Jinwoo's still fighting in the dungeon, he realizes the higher his level gets, the easier it is to kick monster ass. Plus the text describing them starts changing colors. White means they're weak as hell, orange means they're on par with him, and red means they're seriously strong. Those wolves that were red before, now they're white. That means Jinwoo has seriously leveled up like he's become a beast. Jinwoo knows there's this one monster lurking downstairs that he can't mess with at his current level. His perception skills are on point now, and he can feel something straight up terrifying down there. This monster is so damn powerful, it's giving him mad goosebumps. Jinwoo's sword is almost done, and he ain't see any more room for leveling up in this area. But his whole goal is to get stronger, so Jinwoo decides to just go down the damn stairs. When he reaches the bottom bam, something attacks him with lightning speed, and he barely has time to react. Jinwoo's sword snaps in half, and this massive serpent pops up in front of him. Damn, Jinwoo's mind is blown, because even with all his leveling up, this beast's name is still orange to him, which means it's insanely tough. It's crystal clear that this snake is the boss, and there's no way his sword can pierce its thick scales. He knows for sure that fighting without a weapon would be a death sentence, so when the snake strikes, Jin Wu goes all out with his sword. This colossal snake knows how to pack a punch, so Jin Wu needs to figure out a way to get around its defenses. But damn, this thing's armor is hella tough, so all Jin Wu can do is run for his life. The snake whips its tail like a straight up badass, and Jin Wu knows he's screwed if he gets hit. He does his best to block it, but he takes some serious damage. This creature doesn't quit. Jinwoo gets tossed around like a rag doll, and he even has a train launched at him. Our boy thought he had gotten stronger, but it wasn't enough. The train barely misses crushing him, and Jinwoo starts questioning himself. How much stronger does he gotta get before he stops being the laughingstock? He remembers when people called him the weakest hunter ever, and it hits him hard. Song was the one who spilled the beans, and he pumped up Jinwoo to prove them all wrong. As this snake straight up overwhelms him with its crazy power, tossing him into a whole new area, Jinwoo has an epiphany. He got stuck with that nickname because he was weak, the same reason he got mocked. Jinwoo takes a second look and realizes that those with mad strength always have the upper hand in any situation. But the powerless ones ain't got nothing to do around the strong except shake in fear and stand around like losers. The weaklings always get looked down upon. You might be smart, creative and caring, but when you face some serious strength, none of that's gonna save your sorry ass. Jinwoo figures out that being kind won't get him anywhere, so he's gotta toughen up. With this newfound determination, Jinwoo straight up jumps on that snake. The ferocious monster throws him off, but Jinwoo swears to himself that he'll get stronger, and suddenly his body starts glowing. Jinwoo dodges the snake again like a boss and strikes it with his sword, but he's even more determined now. He compares what he's feeling right now to the terror he felt during that raid, and declares that this is gonna be way easier than that day. Jinwoo pulls off this sick move, using his sword to ride the snake again, but then he tosses it aside all shaky, and grabs that beast with his bare hands. Jinwoo admits that he's been laser focused on boosting his strength ever since he got that leveling system. So he decides to rely on that now and starts crushing the snake's tough scales. The snake's trying to shake him off, but it's too damn late because Jinwoo knows he can kill that sucker. Jinwoo straight up demands the snake to die, using his crazy physical strength to defeat it. Then boom, he gets a notification saying he leveled up multiple times and our hero bursts out laughing. He's like, damn, I really got stronger. We see the aftermath of this epic battle. Another notification explains that he just kicked the Swamp King's ass. He gets this badass dagger made from the serpent's fangs that's twice as powerful as Kim's sword. It even has paralysis and drain effects, oh, and he also gets this toxic potion that'll make his skin tough as nails, but mess up his muscles permanently. Now the dungeon turns into a train station, and Jinwoo realizes he beat the whole damn thing by himself. He's walking around with his broken sword, but there's nobody in sight. Some soldier tells Jinwoo to find shelter, but he quickly figures out that Jinwoo is a hunter. The soldier's like, my bad, let's go kick some ass together. 
There are monsters all over the place, so Jinwoo figures it must have been a dungeon break, and some magic beast came out of a portal. The soldier says they handled most of the situation, but there's still one huge badass monster left. Jinwoo's perception ability has gone through the roof, and he can sense where the boss is. We see this massive golem wrecking shit, and the people are scared as hell it's gonna get worse. The hunters are struggling to fight it, and the leader tells the healers to focus on keeping their tank alive. The healers are all like, we're doing our damn job, and the tank wonders what the damage dealers are even doing. The damage dealers are giving it their all, but the golem's defense is insane. And to make matters worse, they don't have enough hunters who can use magic. Jinwoo expertly analyzes the situation and realizes that this group of hunters was put together in a hurry. No wonder they ain't working together. He uses his perception again and sees their ranks. Two A ranks and two D ranks. One of those D ranks is a tank, which explains why they can't take down the golem. This battle's been going on for a hot minute. And then he checks out the healers and is shocked to see that Juhi is one of them. Juhi gets told by one of the hunters to pitch in and help. She reminds her that she's supposed to be a B-rank healer. But then she snaps out of her fear and casts a spell. And the hunters like, stay focused girl. But poor Juhi can't shake off those creepy memories of the giant statue. So she loses her concentration again. Jinwoo notices she's still freaked out. But he doesn't blame her, because he's feeling the same way. Then it hits him that things have actually changed. This golem is a weak-ass D-rank boss, way weaker than the one he just fought. The hunters start freaking out because they're losing the battle real quick, and they realize they ain't got a chance without a higher-ranked hunter. That's when Jinwoo gears up for an attack and figures out that they can take down the golem if they can just break through its defenses. Jinwoo plans to lend them a hand by using an attack strong enough to pierce through the stone. Jinwoo hurls his busted sword with so much force that it straight up shatters the golem's shield, and the hunters start wailing at it. They barely lay a finger on it and manage to bring it down. They can't believe they actually did it, but the tank guy ain't convinced. He's all like, none of our attacks were doing squat before. What the hell broke that thing's defense? He's dead certain it wasn't any of them because they couldn't even scratch the damn thing. Then he spots the sword lying nearby and puts two and two together. He realized that this sword was the reason, but couldn't believe it. I mean this was a boss level golem that even 10 hunters couldn't touch, and now it's taken down by some old beat up sword. He asks if anyone saw who threw the sword, the soldier explains that it was the fisherman they brought with him. But here's the kicker the hunter's gone missing, and the tank stares in utter disbelief. This person had some next level power, and he couldn't help but wonder how high ranked this mysterious hunter was. Jinwoo dipped out of the area to keep his power on the down low, and he's like, I didn't think one attack would do that much damage. Our hero might not even realize the extent of his power because he figures the monster must have been seriously messed up before he struck. The battle's done, and Juhi's wondering if it was Jinwoo who came through in the clutch. Some time passes, and we see the nurses at the hospital gossiping about Jinwoo's rank. They're all talking about how he looks pretty average, but damn, that dude is seriously ripped. In Jinwoo's room, our boy is grinding hard, hustling through his daily workout routine. These thirsty nurses won't shut up about him, they can't even believe how fast he's transformed. One poor nurse straight up falls for Jinwoo, when she catches him post-workout, and she can't stop staring at his ripped body. Today's the day Jinwoo bounces out of the hospital, so this desperate nurse asks for his digit. But Jinwoo ain't all there yet, still stuck on the fact that he thinks she just wants to send him test results after he's released. On the news we catch up with Beak, that S-rank hunter who took down the giant ants. He's one of only 7 S-rank hunters in the country and gives us a glimpse into the life of a top hunter. He breaks it down, saying he's gotta train like a beast every day when he ain't raiding dungeons. Even the smallest mistake could lead to his buddies getting hurt, so he gotta stay sharp, no doubt. Gina notices that Jinwoo is now seriously ripped and has even grown taller. Jinwoo reminds his scatterbrained sister to grab an umbrella for school and sees her off. When he's alone, Jinwoo figures he can hit his run later and wonders if these fresh gains are because of his boosted stats. He figures if he keeps this pace up, he could become a massive bodybuilder. Jinwoo starts thinking about where to allocate the new stats he just got. Dude's sitting at level 18 now. He's now level 18. 
He knows that strength increases his damage, but he also knows it's pointless if he can't land a hit. Besides vitality, perception and agility, he also got this intellect stat. He figures it's gotta be something to do with magic, but he ain't sure if he needs that. Jinwoo makes up his mind and dumps all his points into strength and perception. Right then, Jinwoo gets a call from his landlord, who's reminding him that he hasn't paid last month's rent. Lucky for our hero, he's gotten way stronger, and taking down goblins is a piece of cake now. That means making cash is easier, but there's one issue. To rake in the big bucks, he gotta tackle higher level gates, but ain't nobody letting an E-rank hunter through those doors. Jinwoo thinks about getting his rank reevaluated, but that's a huge risk. Reawakenings are mad rare and ain't nobody has ever seen a hunter level up and keep getting stronger as he can. Jinwoo decides to keep his powers under wraps for now until he can defend himself and figure out more about what he can do. Then out of the blue, Jinwoo is shocked by a job listing and bolts off. The dude's hustling with his daily training to score some reward, and he links up with this hunter named Hung. Hung apologizes to Jinwoo because his crew thinks he's the weakest hunter ever, but Jinwoo plays it cool and lies, saying they ain't wrong. Hung explains they're heading into a C-rank dungeon, but they need at least 8 people to enter. They need Jinwoo to meet that quota, even if he's just an E-rank, but Jinwoo ain't gonna do any fighting. Hung's like, you won't get no rewards either, but we'll hook you up with 2 million yuan. Our hero peeps the situation and sees they have 4 C-rankers and 2 D-rankers. Jinwoo agrees to join, and Hung explains that his gig will be to carry supplies. They must not have a healer, because they gotta haul med stuff. Hung adds that it's tough for independent parties to snag healers. Jinwoo's a bit worried, because this party's full of tanks and damage dealers, but he's like, screw it, I'll sign the contract anyways. A 20-year-old D-rank hunter named Leo was introduced, and Jinwoo figures he must come from a loaded family given his fancy gear. Leo wonders if Jinwoo can handle lugging around all the heavy supplies, but Jinwoo assures him he'll be fine. Leo has no clue that Jinwoo's a beast, and he's tripping if Jinwoo can handle carrying all that heavy crap. Leo starts spouting off about the president overseeing the construction site they're at, blabbering on about how the guy skipped town after swindling 900 billion yuan, leaving everyone astonished. They all roll up to this freaking massive gate and start thinking if it's really just some C-rank dungeon. Leo questions if they'll be alright, so Jinwoo explains that the size of the gate ain't that important. What really matters is the magic power flowing from inside. And that's what the Hunter Association uses to assign ranks. Anything above a B rank, the big guilds take care of, so this C rank joint shouldn't be too much of a challenge. Jinwoo knows all this because he's been a hunter for a while, but he realizes he ain't never actually tackled a C-rank dungeon before. They step through the gate and use the light to check things out, but damn, they're shocked to find there ain't no magical creatures in there. Most dungeons are lit up with glowstones, but this one's pitch black. The darkness reminds Jinwoo of the entrance to that temple, so he starts telling Leo about all sorts of stones. There are these essence stones that hunters nab from magic beasts, mana stones that can be mined from dungeons, and glow stones that light up the damn caves. Jinwoo shuts down that chatty kid real quick and spills the beans about some crazy magic beasts lurking in this dungeon. They're keeping a low profile for now, but our boy's got a hunch. He figures these beasts are like bugs and tells everyone. Everyone freaks out when they realize they're stuck in an ant's nest and can hear those monsters getting closer. Jin Wu says the beasts are above them, so the crew starts going all out, attacking like mad. Hung steps up and uses his taunt skill to draw most of the aggro, and Jin Wu is amazed by their badass leader, who's a C-rank. Leo wants to join the fight, but their mage holds him back saying he's got a trick up his sleeve. After a suspenseful countdown, the mage unleashes a wicked blast. Jinwoo analyzes the situation again, and he can see these hunters have some solid teamwork going on. As for Leo, his gear compensates for his lack of skills. They're all holding their own, but Jinwoo's got this nagging feeling that something's off. He quietly destroys one of the ants, and the fight ends shortly after. Hung declares their victory, and everyone grabs their share of the loot, except Jinwoo. Hung gives props to Jinwoo for saving them a ton of trouble by spotting those ants. Jinwoo's like, no, just followed my instincts. 
But then Hung noticed that some of the ants were messed up, and it wasn't from swords or magic. He thinks maybe some other magic beast got to them, but that would mean there's something even stronger lurking around here. Several ants were torn to shreds, so Hung wondered what could be big enough to take them down. Leo spills the beans about how his pops hooked him up with a bunch of sick gear for his first raid, and Jinwoo's stoked to hear that. He ain't sure why yet, but he tells Leo they gotta be extra careful. Over in another spot, a dude working out gets startled by a loud noise of destruction. But don't trip, someone tells him to chill, because it's just their guild master training, and turns out it's Beak. This dude is a beast, and the kid's jaw drops when he sees Beak smash through a massive stone with just one hit. Beak doesn't even flinch, and says it wasn't even a good warm-up. Back in the dungeon, Leo's still worried about Jinwoo carrying everything. But Jinwoo's like, no man, getting paid to not fight? That's a sweet deal. But deep down, our boy's thinking might be too good to be true. He does some more thinking and realizes this crew is battle-tested but ain't got no healer. Plus, they needed more members to meet the party quota. The group gets worried because they've covered a ton of ground in the dungeon, but haven't come across a single healthy critter. The dungeon boss gotta be alive though, because the gate would've closed if it wasn't. They stumble upon a bunch of webs and figure out that the boss's lair must be through that tunnel. They go through the tunnel and damn, they find a crazy load of mana crystals. Now these crystals ain't as valuable as essence stones, but we're talking at least a billion worth of crystals. One of the hunters even says that Hung's brother would be hella jealous of this find, but they shut him down real quick. Hung's got some hidden motive, they think because his brother can't always be right. Hung ain't about to play second fiddle to his bro, so he's gonna use this massive hall as his own personal strike team training ground. Now Leo is the legal whiz, so he takes a look at Jinwoo's contract and spots something fishy. He tells Hung that the contract only says Jinwoo ain't getting a cut of the battle drops, but mana crystals ain't battle drops. That means they gotta split their findings eight ways instead of seven. Hung all smiles and agrees, but he reminds them that the dungeon boss is nearby. They gotta defeat that boss to close the gate, so they gotta haul those mana crystals out before they take on the spider boss. Lucky for them though, the spider's snoozing. But Hung flips out on one of the hunters because they forgot to bring the transport gear. Hung tells Leo and Jinwoo to chillax while they go fetch the gear, and he assures them that the spider won't wake up unless something pisses it off. Hung points out that they're both newbies to see rank dungeons and tells them to just trust his decision. He's got some business to discuss with his team, so they're gonna take a break too. As they leave, Jinwoo starts analyzing the situation again. He finds it weird that they ain't got any experienced folks to call in and help them meet their quota. From a good distance, we peep at how wicked Hung is. He straight up orders one of his crew to seal off the boss's chamber. The dude follows through, and Leo realizes they got backstabbed. This is exactly what Jinwoo was worried about. He remembers how Song warned him that there are some real crooks in their line of work. Raiding dungeons is no joke. Accidents happen all the time. And in that chaos, crimes can go unnoticed. Ain't no security cameras in these dungeons, so as long as there ain't no survivors, there won't be no evidence. Leo is pissed that these dudes are really willing to throw them under the bus for some mana crystals. He's starting to regret even bringing up the damn contract. But Jinwoo ain't falling for it, they were ready to off them at any moment if they stepped out of line. Now their main concern is the boss that just woke up, and Leo tells Jinwoo to fall back. Jinwoo spots an exit, but he quickly realizes that Hung already knows about it. The spider's wide awake now, and Jinwoo realizes this C-rank beast is on a whole another level. But hold up, our boy ain't about to back down. He takes charge, telling Leo to stay out of the way, because he's gonna throw down with this thing. Jinwoo summons his weapon and declares he's gonna beat its ass. When Hung's crew bails out of that dungeon, the mage is all like, why didn't they just take out those two newbies themselves? But Hung explains they couldn't risk waking up the spider, because they needed snoozing to grab those sweet mana crystals. He ain't worried though, because some dude with zero experience, and the weakest hunter ever ain't got no chance against that spider. The plan is to wait for the spider to chow down on them, and pass out again. They can't go in guns blazing, because it would wake the spider up, but Hung knows about this little path above the cave. Worst case scenario, the spider doesn't pass out after munching on the newbies. 
If their crew can't nab them mana crystals, their group will at least swipe Leo's gear, which is worth a fortune. Hung and the mage both agree they can't take on the spider themselves, and Hung makes it clear the spider shouldn't be slept on. That boss is straight up deadly, and it's just a matter of time before those newbies get smoked. Inside the dungeon, Leo tries to talk Jinwoo out of fighting the boss, because only a B-rank hunter could take down a C-rank dungeon boss solo. Even an elite level C-rank wouldn't stand a chance, so Leo thinks they should bounce and find a way out. Jinwoo recognizes that Leo's right, even though he's had a second awakening and leveled up, he still sees himself as weak. The Golem and Venom bosses were both D ranks, so this spider is on a whole another level. Jinwoo can't explain it, but he ain't feeling any pressure right now. He realizes he must have gotten strong enough to not fear C rank bosses anymore. He's at level 18 and straight up claims he's got a shot at taking it down. Once he starts attacking that spider he's like, well, the real hunt begins now. Over in another spot, this big shot named Gotu, the president of the Hunters Association, is exhausted from being stuck in a bunch of boring meetings. His driver offers to spar with him to cheer him up, and Gotu can't say no when a young buck looks up to him. Back in that dungeon, Jinwoo realizes the spider's skin is hella tough. Its attacks pack a crazy punch, and if Jinwoo gets tagged even once, he's a goner for sure. Leo closely watches Jin Wu's movements and instantly figures out that this ain't how no E rank hunter moves. He's wondering who the hell Jin Wu really is, and starts questioning if he's some fake ass ranker. Only a handful of hunters can control their magic power enough to purposely get a lower rank. Them folks are called false rankers, and usually they're psychos who get a kick out of killing. Leo's starting to regret going into that dungeon, and Jinwoo realizes he can't even put a dent in that spider's tough hide. Jinwoo's fatigue is skyrocketing, and the dude needs to wrap this fight up real quick. His dagger's got some sick paralysis and drain powers, so he figures that's gonna be his ticket to victory. Jinwoo's gotta target the spider's weak spot with those moves, but damn, he's hella surprised when the spider busts out an acid attack. Jinwoo's gotta close the gap, so he decides to use a cool new skill called Dash. He uses it to smack that spider right in the face, but his dagger's debuffs don't stick. Jinwoo ain't one to throw in the towel though. He decides to keep wailing on that spider as much as he can. Dude's pushing himself harder and harder, but his fatigue catches up to him, and that spider lands a nasty hit. Jinwoo's about to get squashed, but guess what? He remembers he's got a reward left from his daily quest, so he cashes it in and fully recovers. Leo's freaking out, thinking Jinwoo's a goner, but our hero ain't done yet. He lands another hit, and this time he straight up stabs that spider in the eye, getting those dagger debuffs going. Jinwoo ain't wasting this chance, so he stabs that spider over and over, keeping those debuffs going strong. Eventually, that spider just can't take it anymore and goes down for the count. A notification pops up, saying Jinwoo just took down the dungeon boss. Jinwoo knows he got lucky not picking a reward before diving into that dungeon, because he'd be six feet under right now for sure. Leo's mind is blown, seeing Jinwoo take down a dungeon boss all by himself. He's more convinced than ever that Jinwoo's some kind of fake ranker. Jinwoo scores a gem from that spider, and Leo rolls up, offering to carry their supplies from now on. Leo straight up idolizes Jinwoo now, telling him to chill and take a break while he handles the mana crystals. Just then, Hong and his crew show up, and they're hella surprised to see the newbies still kicking. In a training room, Gotu straight flexes on Wu, showing off his mad skills by totally overpowering him like it's no biggie. Gotu gives props to Wu, saying he feels way better now. Wu's mind is blown that the prez ain't even rusty. Gotu explains he ain't as strong as before, but he can tell Wu's been grinding hard. Wu acknowledges that training can't level up a hunter, but it can level up their skills. Gotu points out that a hunter's gotta be physically and mentally strong, especially in dungeons where you have the worst kind of people lurking. Back in the dungeon, Hung's crew concludes that the newbies only survived, because this spider must have been dumb as a rock. They straight up clown the spider for losing to low-level hunters. Hung spills the beans to Leo that he knows Leo's from a rich family. But Leo's like, who cares? That's when Hung drops the bomb and tells Leo he's only getting one chance. He tells Leo to straight up off Jinwoo. 
puns like, usually we kill the people we recruit for our party, so we can keep all the loot ourselves. But hey, if Leo agrees to join us, we won't off him. If Leo says no, we'll just kill them both. Hung thinks Leo might be a threat because he has some crazy gear that gives him superpowers to take down the spider. He'd rather not test that theory, so he wants to talk Leo into taking on weak-ass Jin Wu. Hung's stoked when Leo starts heading toward Jin Wu, but then he's all shocked when Leo ends up taking Jin Wu's side. This evil group decides to straight up end their lives, and Hung's wondering if the newbies ever had to off any peeps before. Right then and there, Jin Wu gets an urgent mission, and it's straight up wild because he gotta take out six enemies in front of him. Now the gang decides to go after the weaker one, so the mage attacks Jin Wu. Leo's all worried about his new buddy, and freaked when he sees how messed up Jin Wu is. Meanwhile, one of the group members Chahi, was told to brag about how amazing she was. They struggled with an rank beast, but she took it down in a flash. These girls feel lucky because they are in two of the sickest guilds around. After all, there are all sorts of messed up stories about the other squads. Like those strike teams with crazy high death rates. Back in the dungeon Hung's like, it's game over, Jin Wu's done for. Jin Wu starts beating himself up for forgetting, and reminds himself that this world is all about survival of the fittest. It's a world full of shady tricks and backstabbing. He's straight up fuming because he forgot this truth and realizes he got numb to it. Jin Wu's chilled out now, and he's thinking about how he straight up messed up because he was careless and too damn cocky. This level system is pushing him to kill, so he's wondering if it needs him alive for some reason. He figures this system ain't just being nice, it wants him alive. But that's not all, it also wants him to be strong. So Jin Wu's like, if this system wants to use me, then I may use it right back. He tells the crew that they remind him that the weak ones are the ones who bite the dust in the dungeon. They are stoked to hear the weakest hunter knows how it goes, but Jin Wu points out that they better be ready for when this rule doesn't work in their favor. One of them ain't cool with Jin Wu calling them prey, but Jin Wu wastes no time showing them what he means. Everybody's straight up shocked when this dude's head gets sliced off, and Jin Wu's like, that's one down as the kill count pops up on the updates. Jin Wu just realized he straight up murked someone, but he knows damn well he would have been six feet under if he hadn't. Ain't no turning back now because only the strong survive. The crew snaps out of their shock, seeing an E rank take out one of their D ranks, and they come at Jin Wu with all they have. But it's all futile because Jin Wu starts shanking them one by one. His debuffs kick in, and he takes out two more suckers. The archer is the next to bite the dust under Jin Wu's wrath, followed by the mage. Now there's only one left, and Leo's mind is blown, because Jin Wu's way stronger than when he faced the dungeon boss. Hung buffs up his body and thinks about how he is certain that Jin Wu is tired after dealing with the boss and five other hunters. Plus Hung's made his body as tough as steel, so he figures Jin Wu's dagger won't even scratch him. But Hung starts his attack, and our hero catches him off guard with his lightning speed. Jin Wu knows Hung's a beast, but he drops a bombshell on him. He crushes him and reveals he's been leveling up this whole damn time. Hung realizes Jin Wu ain't in E rank and tries to bribe him with double the cash. But Jin Wu ain't having none of it, because this dude tried to off him three times. Jin Wu mocks him, saying he won't get away with it, and Hung tries to threaten Jin Wu one last time. But Jin Wu reminds him that Hung himself said whatever goes down in a dungeon stays in a dungeon. Hung tries to play tough one last time, but Jin Wu straight up ends his sorry ass. Jin Wu's mission is accomplished, but the whole dungeon starts to crumble because they took down the boss. When they make it out, they're the only ones left standing after the spider showdown. The official ain't buying it because they're the lowest level peeps, but she gets distracted by some used gear. Jin Wu can't believe he's getting rewarded for the bloody mess he just caused, and he realizes he gained a skill that scares the crap out of enemies and cuts their abilities in half. The no-nonsense official concludes that Leo survived because of his gear and assumes Jin Wu, the E-rank scrub, just hid somewhere. Leo gives props to Jin Wu for a job well done, and then it starts raining. Leo wonders if something's up, but the chill Jin Wu explains he's just happy he gave his sister an umbrella. Somewhere else, Wu gets told about this crazy incident where six hunters got wiped out, 
and only two of them made it out alive. It's pretty normal for hunters to dip when they're outmatched in dungeons, but he's hella surprised when he hears that these survivors actually took down the dungeon boss before bouncing. Wu straight up interrupts the dude before he can spill more, but then he gets hit with a bombshell. One of the survivors is none other than Jinwoo. Wu knows this shit involves the infamous Hung, which explains why he got dragged into this mess. Jinwoo rolls back home and lets his sister know that he's gonna cover their mom's hospital bills for a while. Gina thinks he must have scored big cash from his last raid, but she's like, hold up, bro you ain't even injured. She figures he must have had a solid ass team making it easy to take down the bad guys. Jin Wu admits that it was a piece of cake not just because he was way stronger than them, but also because he didn't hesitate to finish them off. In the past, he would have looked for an escape route, but the new Jin Wu was ticked off at them for even thinking they had a shot against him. He wonders if leveling up made him bold, but he reminds himself that they were humans, not dungeon monsters. Gina snaps him back to reality and he remembers why he's getting stronger. It's so he can stay alive and hold it down for his family. So if he had to do what he did in that dungeon again he would. Just then, some harmful substance gets detected in his body, and he realizes it's from what he's drinking. But Jinwoo keeps sipping, and he notices he ain't getting drunk at all. Then a notification pops up, revealing a reward he got from that double dungeon. It cancels out any toxic or messed up conditions and amps up his regenerative abilities. He was too busy to check his rewards that day, but now it all makes sense why he grew his damn arm back. Shit's getting real, my friends. Later on, Jinwoo links up with Leo, who's all grateful for Jinwoo saving his ass. But Jinwoo's like, no kid, you don't owe me shit. Leo hasn't spilled the beans about what really went down in that dungeon, so Jinwoo ain't expecting any payback. But then Leo drops a bomb. He's putting together a strike team, but Jinwoo shuts him down before he can even ask him to join. Leo's begging Jinwoo to give him a chance, saying he just needs him for 19 raids. He spills that he wants to become a guild master, and to do that, he needs at least 20 raids under his belt. Leo's old man wants to start a guild for his construction company, and Leo's down to help however he can. Dungeons are mad dangerous, but the loot they hold makes it all worth the risk. It ain't just about mana crystals and essence stones, everything in a dungeon's got value. Jinwoo gets it. Having hunters rate dungeons for a company is a solid business move. Leo's dad wants an S-rank hunter as the guild master, but Jinwoo's hella surprised because there are only 7s rank hunters in the whole damn country. And to make it worse, the only S-rank who ain't already in a guild is Min, and that dude's retired. This means Leo's pops must be planning to snatch an S-rank from another guild. But Jinwoo warns him about that shit, because he's just gonna make enemies with the guild he takes them from. It's a risky game, my peeps. Leo switches up his game to convince Jinwoo, and straight up tells him he gonna need some backup for their raids, especially if he wants to keep his power under wraps. And that's a genius move because it'll be way more convincing to his old man if he succeeds rolling with a low rank hunter like Jinwoo, who's playing pretend. Leo shows Jinwoo the building they're planning to use as the guild headquarters and says it's worth a crazy amount of money, like 30 billion yuan. That's some serious dough man. Leo wants to give it all to Jinwoo in exchange for his help in completing 19 raids. Jinwoo would have been all over that offer in the past, but things have changed since he became the only dude who can level up. He's dead certain he can reach S rank or maybe even higher the way things are going. But there's still too much unknown about his powers and it would be too risky to team up with someone. So Jinwoo shuts it down and declines the offer. Leo ain't ready to give up just yet though. He promises to take Jinwoo's secret to the grave, but one look from Jinwoo sends chills down his spine, and he bounces. Meanwhile, Hung's younger brother Wang is super pissed about his brother's death and demands to know about the two survivors. His assistant Laura is straight up shocked when he asks what happens if he kills someone in another country, but she spills the beans anyway. If there's a treaty with that country, he gonna have a trial there, but if not, he getting sent back home to face the law. Wang wants to dip out there pronto, but Laura reminds him he has way too much going on, so he plans to deal with it later. He gives the survivors one more glare and just hopes they stick around long enough for him to take them out. The next day, Jinwoo hits the streets for a jog with his sister. 
Jinwoo asks her what she'd do if she had a crazy 30 billion yuan, but she can't even imagine what to do with that kind of cash because it's too damn unrealistic. When Jinwoo's flying solo, he notices his system counter keeps ticking even after he hits his goal. Gina catches up to him, but he already made up his mind to test how far that counter goes, so he takes off running again. He figures out it stops at double the goal, and after trying out all the tasks, the daily quest goes undercover. The reward for this gig comes with some straight-up random loot boxes, but there's a catch one's blessed and the other's cursed. Jinwoo ain't playing around, so he decides to roll with the blessed one for the day, and boom, he hits the jackpot. Homeboy scores another key, and it ain't just any key, it's the key to the Demon King's castle, and it is an S-level acquisition. But hold up, because that ain't even the craziest part. This key comes with a bonus ingredients for something called the Elixir of Life. And let me tell you, that's exactly what Jinwoo needed because this elixir can cure any damn illness. Jinwoo pays a visit to his sick mother, and he knows he ain't got no other choice. He heads to the location, uses the key to open the gate, and he knows damn well this dungeon gonna be tough as nails, on the same level as Jeju Island. Jinwoo starts wondering if he has what it takes to handle this danger, but when a massive gate appears in front of him, he ain't backing down. Inside, flames are engulfing everything, and Jinwoo ain't gonna front he's scared as hell. But hey, he got his teleportation stone as a backup plan in case things go south. Just then, a freaking giant monster pops up right in front of him. But Jinwoo already made up his mind he gotta get stronger, and he swears he ain't dying in this dungeon. This monster has a red name, meaning it's way stronger than him, but Jinwoo has the advantage of being a wolf assassin. Our boy uses Dash to close the distance real quick and starts wailing at the beast. But man, he barely does any damage, even with the bonus effects. Jinwoo tries to activate his murderous intense skill, but the debuff gets cancelled out. Our boy tries to hit the monster with his other debuffs using his dagger, but they get cancelled out too. This monster is straight up brutal as it tears into Jinwoo and he's screaming in pain. Damn, homeboy did lose his arm and his health is dropping like crazy as the beast straight up crushes him. He already lost a third of his life, but it gets even worse because this beast unleashes its 3 minute rage skill, boosting all its abilities by a freaking 100%. The monster's attacks are coming at Jinwoo too quick for him to dodge, so he ain't got no choice but to use his full recovery reward to grow his arm back, but just when he thinks he's making progress and hurting the beast, turns out he's dead wrong, and he just keeps taking a severe beatdown. Jinwoo's HP keeps dropping as he gets straight up stomped on, but he manages to buy himself a bit of time by kicking dirt at the beast, and damn, his system keeps warning him like crazy making it crystal clear that it doesn't want him to kick the bucket. The more this keeps happening, the more Jinwoo realizes this ain't your average reawakening. Jinwoo knows he is way over his head now, so he decides to bust out the teleportation stone. But out of nowhere, Cerberus shows up and knocks that stone right out of his hand. Jinwoo's in deep trouble now, because he only got a few more hits before he's done for. The dude's brain is working overtime Trina think of a solution, and just when he's about to lose hope, he remembers he got a shop in his system. He quickly buys three healing potions, but here's the catch they only heal 100 health points each. The poison he gonna face from fighting the snake pops right up in front of him, and he realizes he has no other choice but to give it a shot. Jinwoo chugs that poison like a boss, so the system picks it up as a harmful substance and detoxifies it. It's a complete success because Jinwoo's muscles stay intact, and now he takes 20% less physical damage. Cerberus ain't playing around, and it lands a straight devastating attack on Jinwoo. But Jinwoo ain't giving up just yet, man. Homeboy declares he can still move, and guess what? The three-minute timer on the monster's rage skill is up. The effects wear off, and now the damage Jinwoo inflicted on its eye starts taking its toll on the beast. Jinwoo seizes the opportunity and starts landing multiple attacks, finally making a dent in that sucker. The beast almost chomps him up, but Jinwoo somehow manages to hold it back. Dude goes airborne, but that powerful monster smashes him right back into the ground. Jinwoo finds himself in a tight spot once again, with his health dam near depleted and Cerberus squeezing him between its teeth. 
But Jinwoo ain't done fighting just yet he digs deep and keeps stabbing that beast, even as it tosses him around like a Zoro. Jinwoo keeps on attacking, pouring every ounce of strength he has into one final blow. And guess what? That's the knockout punch right there. Cerberus comes crashing down, and a notification pops up it says Jinwoo has defeated Hell's Gatekeeper. Homeboy levels up several times and his wounds magically heal. Killing the gatekeeper earns Jinwoo the key to the demon's castle. He figured that's what Cerberus was protecting, but then he gets hit with a mysterious notification. It's the recipe for the elixir of life, and it requires three ingredients found in the castle. Jinwoo's fight with Cerberus gives him a clear idea of his current strength, and he realizes something. If he were to venture into the demon's castle right now, he'd be six feet under for sure. Jinwoo concludes that he can't do it just yet, but he makes a promise he gonna come back real soon. After that, Jinwoo heads over to see his mom and wonders if he can really cure her eternal sleep disease. He ain't got none of the three things he needs for the elixir of life, but at least he knows where to find them. But damn, trying to enter the castle at his current level would straight up lead to his death. That's why he's gotta level up and get stronger, no doubt. To help with that, Jinwoo decides to roll with Leo on the 19C rank raids he was talking about earlier. Jinwoo's got one condition though, and Leo's hella shocked when Jinwoo says they gotta do the raids just the two of them. No one else. But Leo says what the hell, because rank C gates require at least 18 members to enter. But Jinwoo wants them to go with a hung strategy, so they gotta hire enough hunters to meet the quota. Leo's kinda hesitant because it could be risky as hell. But Jinwoo points out that if just the two of them can beat 19 raids, that's gonna be mad impressive, and it's all about impressing his old man. Leo agrees to go to hell and says he'll handle everything. In another spot, Chahi's getting her exercise on, running in circles, and taking a sec to gulp down some water and replenish her body's fluids. She ain't playing around because she knows someone's been creeping on her. So this dude named Yoon finally comes out of hiding and introduces himself. On the other side, Leo's dad tells Leo how shit's gone crazy since the gates showed up 10 years ago. The world's infrastructure can't even function no mo without the resources from them dungeons. Only the hunters can get those crucial resources, so they're hella important, and the Hunters Association keeps an eye on them. They oversee a lot of stuff, including managing the gates, but they are not the ones that benefit the most. The guilds are the ones raking in the dough from the dungeons, scooping up the vast majority of their vital resources. They are balling rich man, we talking about the Hunter Guild, White Tiger Guild, Reaper Guild, Fame Guild and Knights Guild, the top 5 guilds in the whole country. They got a monopoly on all the profits from their dungeons. But Leo's pops ain't having none of that, he ain't letting it go on like that. He knows they gotta establish their own guild to achieve his goal, straight up. Leo's thinking about how risky it would be to hire some unknown's rank to partner up with his bro. But if his pops picked him as the guild leader instead, that problem could be solved. Over at the park, Jinwoo's doing his own running. Homeboy notices that any extra exercise he does ain't getting counted anymore. That damn cursed loot box he was offered before ain't even an option now. So he pulls out a regular loot box, hoping to find something good, but all he gets is a bingo card. Not what he was hoping for man, time goes by and Jinwoo keeps training, but he realizes the three points he's getting ain't doing much anymore because he leveled up. Leo still gotta get his shit together before they can enter the c rank dungeons, but Jinwoo has a realization. If he can get back into that penalty zone, he might be able to take on that centipede he faced before. But he knows the fight might be tougher than he thinks, and there ain't no guarantee he'll get any experience points from it. Just then, Jinwoo gets a notification to join a D-rank mission. But hold up, it's from the Hunters Association, so that means he won't be able to fight solo. Over at some dojo, Song finishes up schooling some kid, teaching him a lesson. The kid's like, damn, I wish I fought you when you were at your best. But Song's real with him, saying he can't change the fact that he only has one arm now. Then Song gets a notification to join a raid, and the kid's like, why you ain't retired yet? Song has some messed up memories, and he's missing a major part of his body, so the kid apologizes for making him feel down. Song explains that his prime years are in the past, but he still wants to contribute to society in his remaining time. 
Over in another spot, we got this kid playing while her scaredy cat dad Kim watches. He gets the same notification and knows it's his next raid. His wife reminds him that he barely made it out alive from his last one, and she wants him to consider doing something else. But Kim tells her they need the money because their kid's starting school soon. He assures her that it's gonna be all good because the Hunters Association doesn't send low-ranked hunters on dangerous missions, except for that one time. So the whole fam starts professing their love for each other and shit. In another spot, Beak is straight up pissed about having to do some useless interview. And it only makes him angrier when Mr. Choi tries to butter him up. But he chills out when Choi points out that he's the most fit for the job. Turns out Choi called him to his office to let him know that Eugen Construction is starting its own guild. But Beak already knows all that, so he demands Choi tell him what he's really there for. In Juhi's room, her mom straight up tells her to give up on being a hunter. Juhi's a B-rank hunter, but her mom still thinks she'll just get in everyone's way. She wants Juhi to come home, but that just sets Juhi off. She declares that her mom needs to stop Trina control her life. Juhi says she can make her own decisions and proves it by hanging up on her. Juhi admits she might be in the way, but she still wants to try and get better, and right then, she also gets the notification about the D-rank raid. Back at the office, Chahi walks by Beak and tells Choi that some scout approached her. Turns out it was from Yujin Construction, and they wanted her to be their guild master. But she turned down the offer, though now she's curious about what they talked to Beak about. Beak's chilling at a bar, thinking about their convo. Jojo Island's been sealed off since that failed raid, and folks Trina forget about the terror it brought. Mr. Choi sees himself as the weapon of humanity, but he can never forget about Jojo Island and or what happened there. He plans to clear the island soon, and for that, he needs Beak and the crew on the same page. They gotta get stronger, gather allies, and sway public opinion. That's why he set up the interview and had Chahi train new hunters. Choi reminds Beak that he left something behind on that island, jogging Beak's memory about losing his old friends. In a dark place, an ugly man is pleading with someone to eliminate people. At Jinwoo's house, Jin is straight up shocked by how busy he's been. The old Jinwoo used to need weeks to recover after each gate, so she's wondering if all his training is paying off. Jinwoo casually dips out on a mission without taking his gear, and she's worried because he's acting like it's just a regular trip to the sea. In another spot, Song's thinking about how he's a swordsman, but his awakened ability ain't got nothing to do with physical power. All them years he spent training in martial arts don't mean jack inside a dungeon. His magic focus powers make his sword useless against them magical beasts. Then out of nowhere, he bumps into Jinwoo and notices how different he looks. Jinwoo can't really explain why his leg's back, so Song assumes some high-ranked healer must have found him that day. Song ain't as lucky because too much time passed for his injury to heal. They reach the gate and are surprised to see it's a reunion. Kim feels ashamed to face them, but Song figures it makes sense after what he did. Five survivors from that messed up day are back together, so he's wondering what the deal is. It's been a hot minute since Juhi saw Jinwoo, so she peeps how much he's changed too. Right then, some sketchy dudes roll up and start checking out Juhi like they have a thing for her. But Kong's there too, and he shuts them down, telling them to chill. Turns out these peeps are prisoner substitute hunters, straight up hunter convicts Trina reduce their sentences. Song can't believe they got a fight alongside criminals, but the woman assures them they won't be a problem. They were understaffed and had no other choice. Just in case though, Kong's rolling with them. He is a B rank, so if things go south, he can handle the three C rank criminals with ease. Jinwoo tells Juhi not to come along, but she ain't having it. The criminals get set free, and even they wonder if this is a good idea. Kong shuts them up again and reminds them what'll happen if they act up. He introduces himself to the others and promises he'll handle the criminals. Jinwoo lets Song take charge of the raid, and he appreciates it. Song takes full responsibility for failing that day and gives props to Jinwoo for being the only reason they all made it out alive. He thanks Jinwoo on behalf of all the survivors, but Jinwoo doesn't need it. Kim ain't got no objections to Song leading them, and Kong's staring at Jinwoo for some reason. Everyone gets ready to enter the gate, and Song declares the raid officially started.
Inside the dungeon, the prisoners straight up handle those goblins like monster. Song Chu wonders who the real beasts are and shows off his own power. They eventually wipe out the whole group of goblins, and Song's impressed with how much stronger Jinwoo's become. Even Juhi notices that Jinwoo ain't been hurt yet, and she hopes nobody ends up needing her healing skills. Song's still amazed because Jinwoo's aura is on a whole different level. Kong leads them forward, but they come across a fork in the path. The dungeon's been easier than they thought, so they figure it's cool to split up. It's gonna be riskier, but they'll clear the dungeon faster. Jinwoo can sense the boss is down the left path, but he keeps it to himself. Because he ain't been leveling up much from those weak-ass goblins, Jinwoo suggests his group take the left path. They split up, but Kong's giving Jinwoo some weird-ass look. Kim's group members are a bunch of cowards, and Kim decides they gotta apologize to Jinwoo for ditching him on their first raid. They know he probably won't accept the apology, but Kim's determined to try because he wants to keep being a hunter. Down the other path, the prisoners straight up wipe out another group of goblins with ease. Kong being all weird, asks if they could do the same against humans, but they make it clear it wouldn't make a damn difference. Here's the backstory. Kong found out some dude's daughter got assaulted by three dudes. The poor girl ended up taking her own life, and this guy's furious because those three scumbags will be free in just a few years. To make matters worse, those assholes are hunters, and they get to join raids to reduce their sentences. That shit's unfair as hell because his daughter ain't never coming home. So the man brings 3 million yuan, and offers it to Kong to take out those three prisoners. Kong's gone straight up bonkers now, and he spills the beans to the prisoners about what he's gonna tell the inspectors when he dips out of the dungeon. He's gonna say the prisoners got wiped out by a gang of 100 goblins. Kim keeps going down his path, but he's shocked when it connects to Kong's path, and he finds Kong massacring the prisoners. Kong starts telling the prisoners he's been told to make them suffer, but Kim interrupts his crazy ass. Cold-blooded Kong takes out the last prisoner and decides he's gotta change his plans as he starts making his way toward Kim. Jinwoo's thinking about how Kong saw him at the hospital, and he just hopes the dude doesn't remember him. Just then, they hear screams, and they rush over to find the dead prisoners. Turns out Kang got eliminated too, and Jinwoo's shocked when he sees Kim in bad shape. Juhi works her healing magic on him, but Song can tell this ain't the doings of no magical beast. The weapon used was too damn sharp, and whoever used it purposely avoided finishing him off multiple times. Kim's given up on surviving, but Jinwoo reminds him he's got a family. Jinwoo demands he stay alive, otherwise he won't be able to keep blaming him. Kim uses his last breath to apologize to Jinwoo, then he's gone. Right then, Kong tries to take out Juhi, but Jinwoo steps in and stops him. Kong's impressed by Jinwoo's speed, and Song realizes Kong's the one behind this whole massacre. Song's shocked because Kong's part of the Hunters Association, but Kong just wants to spill his plan. Instead of blaming the goblins, Kong's gonna say the prisoners wiped out all the other hunters. He'll claim they tried to take him out, but failed, which is why he's the lone survivor. Song holds Jinwoo back because he doesn't think he can take on Kong. Instead, Song Chiu steps up to fight him, even though he knows Kong's a B rank, a whole level above him. Juhi buffs Song up with strength, and he tries to use his sword skills to take Kong down. But damn, Kong manages to dodge every damn hit, and he gives props to Song Chiu for knowing his shit. Jinwoo analyzes the situation and realizes Song Chiu's holding his own, but he ain't fast enough to win. Kong lands a brutal blow, but gets annoyed when Juhi quickly heals Song. Kong decides he's gonna take out Juhi first, but Song steps in and stops his ass. Kong underestimated the old man, so Song lets him know he's trained as rank hunters before. His blade may be outmatched, but Kong points out that Song's power has its damn limits. Ain't no chance a mage type like him can beat an assassin type, so Kong brings him near death. Juhi's too scared to heal him, and Kong gets ready to finish off Song for good. But Song Chiu pulls out his fire ability. But damn, Kong's too damn quick. He realizes Song Chiul used his sword to make him drop his guard against magic. Song Chiul was waiting for Kong to try and end his life, then bam, he hits him with a surprise fire blast. Kong sees through the plan though, and now Song Chiul's paying with his life. But wait a damn minute, Jin Wu finally steps in to put an end to the fight. Kong demands to know who the hell he is, and Jin Wu straight up says he's just an E rank hunter. Kong doesn't believe him because he'd need some next-level reaction speed to stop the attack he just used on Song. Kong can tell Jinwoo's hiding his power and figures he had a second awakening. The others are shaken, and Kong suddenly remembers Jinwoo from the hospital. 
The mana reader only read 10 back then, so Kong thinks this second awakening must have happened after that. This shit doesn't add up. It doesn't explain why Jinwoo was able to survive the double dungeon. But Kong doesn't give a damn, he's ready to take out Jinwoo. Jinwoo wants answers, so Kong says he is just dishing out justice by taking out the prisoners. But Jinwoo doesn't give a damn about them. But he wants to know why he eliminated Kim and Kang. He points out that Kong could have done it quickly and easily, but he didn't. Kong seemed to enjoy torturing and playing with them. Flashback to when Kong talked to the father, and he explains how he's been getting big offers from the top guilds. But he chooses to work for Peanuts in the Hunter Association. Why? Because he finds killing people way more fun than killing beasts. A straight-up fight goes down between Kong and Jinwoo, and the two onlookers are blown away by their insane speed. Kong can tell they have similar builds, but he figures he's got way more experience fighting high-ranked opponents. He uses that experience to gain control of the fight, but he's shocked when Jinwoo asks him to tone down the bloodlust. But it's too damn late because Jinwoo's system is taking notice. The system, just like last time, tells Jinwoo that there are peeps present looking to take him out. Once again, Jinwoo gets a quest to eliminate his opponents. Jinwoo gets engulfed in some dark power, and Kong's confused because he thought he'd have the upper hand in this fight. But damn, Jinwoo straight up attacks, and Kong's shocked when he realizes he's been poisoned. They keep throwing down, but Kong's got something special to show Jinwoo too he straight up disappears. He explains it's a stealth skill, making him invisible to sight sound and even smell. Only a few hunters can get their hands on that skill, and nobody knows he's got it. Kong manages to land a hit on Jinwoo, and tells the others to back off and wait their turn. He's sure Jinwoo won't be able to do much with an injured leg. But damn, Kong's in for a surprise when Jinwoo instantly heals himself. Kong can't believe it because he's never heard of a combat hunter who can also use healing magic. Jinwoo's totally unpredictable, and that makes him one dangerous mofo. Jinwoo's changed big time, saying he just lost another emotion, and now he doesn't even need to get angry to take out scum like Kong. Kong realizes Jinwoo's taken human lives before, and Song is shocked to hear that. He figures Jinwoo's had to make some tough-ass decisions real quick, and that's why his appearance ain't the only thing that's changed. Kong tries to attack again, but he's in for a shock when Jinwoo tracks him by sensing his bloodlust. Kong still has a trick up his sleeve, but everything stops when Jinwoo activates his murderous intense skill. Darkness surrounds Kong, and he's straight up stunned when Jinwoo's blade goes through his chest. As Kong's life slips away, he mentions that he and Jinwoo are cut from the same cloth, they're both killing machines. The only reason he's dying is because he's weaker than Jinwoo. Kong still wants to know what the hell Jinwoo is. He's got assassin skills, healing powers and debuffs and Kong's never heard of anyone like that. Jinwoo doesn't spill the beans, but Kong points out that Jinwoo was able to take him out, so his E-ranked act is over. Jinwoo decides to drop a little truth bomb, and explains that he's someone who gets stronger with every damn fight. Kong can see that Jinwoo's gonna keep getting stronger and stronger, but he's got a warning for him if he keeps chasing more and more power, that same power might end up taking control of him. Jinwoo completes his quest and gets rewarded. He's noticed that the stronger he gets, the more it feels like something inside him is falling apart. His friends thank him for saving their asses, but Jinwoo tells them to get the hell out of the dungeon. They're shocked because Jinwoo plans to clear the dungeon all by his lonesome, but they realize he's strong enough to pull it off. Outside, Wu's mind is blown when he learns Kong is secretly killing folks. He is shown the only survivors of the mission Kong was on, and he's straight up surprised to see that Jinwoo's one of them. He apologizes for what went down, but most importantly, he wants to know who took out Kong. Jinwoo realizes he can't keep his secret anymore, which means he gotta cancel his deal with Leo. Right before he spills the beans, Song straight up lies and claims he's the one who eliminated Kong. Song's just a C-rank, so he explains he only won because he had a healer's help. Wu's skeptical because Kong's a top B-rank hunter, but he buys Song's story, just then, Jinwoo reminds himself that he cannot get overconfident. He couldn't tell before, but Wu's in a rank hunter. Jinwoo can sense his crazy ass power now, and he knows he doesn't stand a chance against this dude in a fight with his current strength. Song determines that Jinwoo has a good reason for keeping a secret, so he tells Jinwoo that this is just him paying him back for what happened in the double dungeon. That night, Juhi wonders if Jinwoo remembers the stone he gave her. Jinwoo and Juhi take a little stroll while chatting about how much Jinwoo's changed. 
Juhi's the total opposite because she ain't changed a bit, and she realizes she's too timid to be a hunter. She should really be joining them a rank raids, but she settles for the lowest rank ones instead. It ain't all that bad though, because it led her to meet Jinwu, and she started healing him. The dude was always getting himself hurt, but she'll never forget how his eyes always had that determined look. Juhi gives back the crystal he gave her and spills that she's gonna retire. She's heading back to live with her folks, but they agree to hang out if they ever cross paths again. A look back shows that Wu was very skeptical of Jinwu. He didn't believe some E rank like him could take down B rank Kong. Jinwu was already found to not have had a reawakening, so we just let him be. But Wu did give him a warning though. Hung's brother Dongsu heard that Jinwu and Leo were the only ones who survived after his brother got wiped out, so he might be coming after them. This shit's damn shocking because Dongsu's an S rank hunter. Dongsu probably doesn't give a damn about the facts and is just pissed that Jinwu made it while his brother didn't. Unfortunately for Jinwu, the law can't do shit against S rank hunters, and they can bring either miracles or disasters. One of these monsters is after Jinwu, so Wu suggests he gather his family and dip out of the country. But Jinwu just sees this as another reason to get stronger, because if he doesn't, he ain't gonna survive. Jinwu rolls up to meet Leo, but he's hella confused by what he sees. Leo explains that this is their strike team. He focused on finding people who have the skills to be hunters, but can't work for various reasons and are struggling to make ends meet. Jinwu points out that he hired a high schooler, but she claps back saying she's a qualified hunter just like the rest. She does get a bit down when Jinwu figures out she's an E-rank with no raiding experience. But it doesn't really matter because Jinwu lets them all know they'll be waiting outside while he and Leo handle everything. They're all getting paid 3 million yuan each, which is a sweet deal because they ain't gotta do shit. The only catch is they can't blab about it to anyone, or they gotta pay back 10 times what they got. Jinwoo got a stealth rune for taking down Kong, and he used it to learn stealth skills. Leo's all set to go, and Jinwoo's shocked to see he's rocking even more crazy expensive armor. Jinwoo straight up schools Leo on how dumb it is to rock that armor and demands he ditch it. But Jinwoo lets him keep the helmet at least, and they step into the portal. The other hunters think they're straight up insane for hitting up a C rank dungeon on their own, but they don't give a damn because the contract's already sealed. Jinwoo's sis wonders where her friend Songyi is, and turns out she's the high schooler on Jinwoo's strike team. The hunters chat about how a full strike team would take a solid two hours to finish this raid, so when they see Leo pop out of the portal, they assume they just bailed. But they're in for a shock because the damn gate closes right after they step out, meaning they cleared the dungeon. The hunters can't believe their eyes, but Jinwoo tells them to hustle because he's ready for another portal. Their goal is to hit up three raids in a single day, but the hunters are still dumbfounded they even finished one. In another raid, Jinwoo straight up wrecks a bunch of goblins while Leo wraps up the mining. Jinwoo mops up the goblins and levels up. The next raid's a success too, and Jinwoo levels up even more. Days go by, and the two keep clearing dungeons on their own. They start facing tougher and tougher monsters, but Leo can see Jinwoo's getting hella stronger too. Jinwoo's stealth skill is hella handy, and his dash skill levels up. He gains a couple more skills and finds out they're straight up powerful when he uses them on a wolf. Jinwoo's got a bunch of new skills now, but his mana ain't enough to use them for long. He chugs a potion for that and decides he's gonna focus on boosting his intellectual abilities moving forward. He also decides against heading back to the demon castle right now, because he considers himself somewhere between a B rank and a rank hunter. Just then, the system reveals that he has reached the required level for a job change quest. Somewhere else, the boss of another guild named On gets word that there's a strike team splurging double the market rate to snag some C-rank gates. Their leader's this rich kid Leo, but their team seems like a random mix. On recognizes the name Jinwoo from the double dungeon incident, and he gets this feeling that something interesting is going down. Meanwhile, Jinwoo and Leo come out of another portal victorious. Jinwoo wonders if Songye has some eye problem, but she says it's nothing. Back with On, his assistant is straight up shocked when he hears On thinking that Jinwoo's had a reawakening. Jinwoo managed to survive three major disasters and every time there was a damn high body count, but he always made it out alive. Reawakening's the only explanation, so On heads out to scout this promising rookie. On rolls up at Jinwoo's portal, but he's hella shocked because it looks like they're having some sort of picnic. 
Song Yi explains the area's off-limits and makes it clear she's a hunter. She admits she's part of the strike team, and An's mind is blown when he realizes Jinwoo straight up left the whole crew behind to enter the dungeon solo. An thinks Jinwoo could be his biggest discovery yet, but he surprisingly just leaves. The dudes step out the gate, and Jinwoo spills to Leo that he's swamped tomorrow and can't make it for any raids, so they hold off on a few. Then we get a glimpse of this super weird scene, and Mr. Choi wakes up from that nightmare. He peeps at some paperwork and figures out it's almost time for the recon mission on Jojo Island. Jinwoo wraps up his day of raiding and An introduces himself as the manager of the White Tigers Guild. The White Tigers Guild is one of the top guilds in the country, always hunting for new talent. An thankfully gets right to the point and offers to pay Jinwoo double what Yujin Construction is paying him if he joins his guild. An's hella confident Jinwoo's in E rank and can't turn down that offer. But he's in for a surprise when Jinwoo wants to know the worth of the White Tigers Guild headquarters. It's worth a cool 50 billion, so the dude's mind is blown when Jinwoo reveals that a construction company's hooking him up with a building worth 30 billion. Jinwoo backs up his claim with evidence, but An reveals that he isn't qualified to offer them their 50 billion building. Jinwoo loses interest and bounces, but he's curious how An got wind of him. Jinwoo puts fear in this dude, making sure he ain't snooping around, and then vanishes. An realizes that Jinwoo used stealth to cut him, and he's hella shocked when he considers Jinwoo's reawakening with that stealth ability. Jinwoo tells him not to turn around, so An explains he's just digging into who's buying up all the gates. Jinwoo demands to know who else knows about him, and An spills it's just him and one of his peeps. Jinwoo warns that if word starts spreading about him, they'll be the first suspects on his list. An agrees to keep everything on the down low, so Jinwoo reveals himself again. Jinwoo gotta keep snatching the gates for a while, but that's causing problems for the guild because they need to train new recruits. Jinwoo agrees to let them cop three gates from him, but An's straight up shocked when Jinwoo tells him they gotta cough up 300 million yuan for each. The dude begs Jinwoo to drop it to 200 million, and Jinwoo surprisingly agrees. They seal the deal for three gates, but their interaction ain't over because Jinwoo wants to hook On up with something. He tells On to close his eyes and open his mouth, and then Jinwoo hands him a healing potion for that cut on his face. Jinwoo reveals he trusts On, but he reminds him to keep his trap shut. An's assistant wonders how it went down, and An tells him he thinks Jinwoo might be an even bigger deal than he originally thought. The next day, Leo confirms they got the 600 million yuan. Leo points out they were gonna ditch the gates anyway, so he can't believe Jinwoo managed to score so much cash for them. Leo wants to know more, but Jinwoo says it's a trade secret. Back with the White Tiger Guild, An realizes Jinwoo played him, because now there's a bunch of C-rank gates that have appeared selling for less than 70 million yuan. Jinwoo sends him a message informing him that they are now on an equal footing after spying on him. An realizes Jinwoo ain't someone to mess with, but he's glad he got his contact info. Elsewhere, we see Jinwoo heading out on a road trip to find out what this job change quest is all about. Thanks for checking out my recap. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and smash the notification bell so you don't miss any future content.